Welcome to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits, so get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Chris Goldblatt, and Chris is the founder and CEO of the Fish Reef Project. Welcome, Chris. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see you again, Cindy. Oh, gosh. I always love hearing about what you're up to. Yeah. Not only is it an inspiring project and fascinating, but you're always changing it up, adding new things. And so tell us what's happening. Well, these are very exciting times for the Fish Reef Project. As you know, we've been around for 12 years as a homegrown Santa Barbara nonprofit. Uh, and we're sort of leading what you call the, the blue tech innovation where we're creating technologies that restore and rebuild our local kelp forests. And our, our primary technology is called a sea cave, which is, you'll see in a moment in a video, it's a, a one-ton marine concrete unit that is de designed specific, specifically chemically and the shape to recruit giant kelp so we can have our kelp forests back. So really the whole incentive for this, the whole reason that you started it mm -hmm. is because the kelp was Kind of going away. Right. I, I've grown up on the coast and going back all the way to 1983 when we had this huge El Nino and giant waves. What they did is they scoured the seafloor in, in our area and there used to be this beautiful underwater sort of river of rocks that came out every 100 or 200 years off the mountains like we saw in 2017 with all mm -hmm. those big boulders that came down. Yes, yes. Uh, but unfortunately, because humans have houses and roads and hedges, those boulders don't make it to the sea. Oh. And that's our reef material around here. There are some places with big natural reefs, like off of Hendry's Beach or Isla uh -huh. Vista, but mostly it's just flat mud that needs those rocks from the hills to create critical structure for kelp to grow and for fish to live. So mankind, humans, us, we are depriving the ocean of this critical habitat for the kelp seeds to settle and grow and become kelp forests, which are the heart of our entire marine ecosystem. It's our underwater redwood forest. It's, it's the birthright of every Californian, and we just don't have it. And the Fish Reef Project is able to bring it back with sea caves, and it's a proven technology center. So did you think of this sea cave thing all by yourself? Well, we have an amazing team. I like to call them ocean badasses uh, <laughs> of, of women and men that are just very dedicated. They, uh -huh. they worked like me for 12 years, some of us 40 hours a week with very little or even no compensation, just out of love of the ocean. Oh, so, wow. um, yes, I, I, I guess you could say I am the inventor of the sea cave through the engineering process and all the intellectual properties and the patents and the trademarks that we have all over the world and that. Um, but in the end of the day, it was a team collaboration where everybody who has spent so much time underwater and seen how the marine ecosystem mm -hmm. works um, on our team and also outside uh, academics and folks like that have all contributed to the end design that is just tremendously successful. How did you think of it anyway? Well, I, I've been underwater since I was eight years old, uh -huh. uh, mostly chasing fish and lobster around for, for dinner. Uh, and um, you, you spend enough time uh, underwater staring at structure. Mm -hmm rocks and things like that and you really gain an understanding of what shape they need to be, how deep they need to be, uh, and what their orientation underwater needs to be in their chemistry in order to have a maximum what you call recruitment of marine life so that so the most things settle on it and grow. So it was really a compilation of just spending 40 years underwater uh, and just learning about the marine ecosystem uh, through observation. Wow, that is brilliant. And so th this is a little one. I know yeah. they're really giant, right? But yes, this is a, exactly. A little version that, of that. That's a baby sea cave. You can put that in your fish tank and your home fish oh. will love it. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the, the kelp settles and grows because it kind of likes flat surfaces. So the top of it is flat. So the, the kelp can settle and grow and make a big what's called a holdfast, which is kind of the base of it that grabs onto it. And that can get big and strong and it can withstand all kinds of storm conditions and live its full life. So then you manufacture these and they're giant. Mm -hmm. Tell me how mm -hmm. big right. they are. They, uh, they weigh about 2,400 pounds. <laughs> they're six feet by four feet by three feet tall. Uh -huh. uh, and they've been placed so far over the past two years since we introduced them at the Maritime Museum three years ago uh, in uh, four different locations, both in Mexico and South Carolina. And they've withstood class four hurricane direct hits, uh, 
30-year storm event, direct hits, and they haven't disappeared in the sand, they haven't moved, they're very, very stable. And the chemistry of the concrete's important. If you put regular concrete in the ocean, not much will happen, it's too acidic. Mm. Uh, but, but we have a proprietary formula of concrete that matches the pH of seawater. So that way, sensitive creatures like soft corals and giant kelp, as you'll see in the video we're about to watch, uh, settle and grow, and, and they're chemically uh, attracted to it. They have an affinity towards it. Gosh, so, I mean, you just thought of it, but then did it take a long time for you to fine tune the whole project? It, it did, so it becomes a series of educated guesses. Uh -huh. So when you're a burgeoning nonprofit like the Fish Reef Project, you have limited resources, and when you're doing something for the first time, the learning curve can be very steep. Yeah. So we worked with really good engineers and we took our best shot. And oh, what we did is we came up with this amazing, it's basically a precast concrete system where you can fill the molds up and you can make one of these in about two minutes. And whereas other types of similar structures uh, around the world can take hours or days to make. So you can make these in large enough scale to where you can restore large amounts of kelp. And, and you're not um, stuck with a limited scale. They can be, they can, it can be scaled. That's yeah. a very important thing. And then they last for hundreds of years once they're underwater. Gosh, okay. So I'm eager to see this video mm -hmm. that you're going to show us in just a, a minute or so. And um, so while they're getting that video ready, let me ask you, how many of these sea caves have you put out there so far in this 12 years? So we built the first uh, dozen or so right here in Santa Barbara, and then those went in various places around the country uh, by truck. And then to move things along quickly, we've opened a yard in Ensenada, Mexico, where we currently have 200 sea caves uh, in inventory that we've built over the past few months, which is quite a large amount. It's a good first start. Yeah. There will be thousands, but right now there's 200. And of those, we've deployed about 50 uh, throughout Mexico and South Carolina. And the oldest ones uh, in Mexico, which is the exact same ecosystem as Santa Barbara, that's important to oh. mention, that the area they're in, in Baja, has um, year-round giant kelp. And the same lobster we have, the same abalone that we have, the same calico bass, it's the same ecosystem. Uh, so if people want proof positive, all they have to do is watch the video, uh, and they can see that in the same ecosystem, it's extremely effective. That's great. So um, I know that they're getting the video ready right now, and mm -hmm. so we're going to see it pretty soon. I think it's about five minutes long. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, how long have you been working down in Mexico then? We've been down there for, for about a year. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's pretty new. Yeah, yeah. So and it, we have projects in various parts of the world. So Santa Barbara's our home. That's where we want to bring back the kelp, yeah. right? That's where we're all from. Uh, but we take great pride in our work in, in Mexico because it's the same ecosystem and you can prove the kelp growth. And we've been down there for about a year. We have a great team uh, for Fishery Project Mexico. We also work in very far away places like Papua New Guinea, which is an really? island chain above Australia. It's in the Coral Sea and, and it's doing amazing things with uh, bringing back the biodiversity in the coral. Uh, and it's a great check on climate change because the reefs can what you call sequester or remove carbon dioxide directly from the ocean. Mm. And this is called blue carbon. And the oceans hold huge amounts of mankind's CO2 footprint. Okay, so we've basically dumped a lot of our CO2 in the oceans in it. And that's where a lot of it's locked up. And you can't remove it through uh, traditional uh, CO2 removal things that we do on land. You have to pull it directly out of the ocean. And the sea caves, each one removes about four tons a year of carbon dioxide, whether it's in a, a coral ecosystem or a cold water kelp ecosystem. So it's a great check on the, on the climate change fight as well. Wow, that's just so, so, I mean, it's way above my pay grade yeah. to understand all yeah. that. I'm just yeah. uh, marveling at, and how you figured it out, how you keep it going. So, Papua, so, so does Papua New Guinea have the same, a similar um, ecosystem as we do? No, no they're, so they're tropical, right? So, so you, it, it's basically a similar ecosystem to like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And then we're also working in Africa, in, in Senegal uh, on the west side, and in Djibouti on the east side. And those are both tropical, and those provide huge amounts of food and job security. 
uh, in Africa for Africans. Uh, and then we most recently started in Bangladesh, which oh. I just got back from. That, that's an amazing place. Really amazing people in Bangladesh, I got to tell you. And, um, but it's all about the, the, the local sustainability of the fisheries. So they have a place to fish and, and the fish can propagate. Because you have to understand the ocean is basically a desert. Okay, we, we think of the ocean as being full of reefs because we all watch the Discovery Channel and right, right. Little Mermaid, yeah. things like that, right? It's not true that the, the ocean has maybe 1% uh, actually being a reef structure, but that's where all the life is. Oh. The rest of it is sort of vapid, not lifeless, but just kind of empty sand and mud. And when you place things like sea caves down there, you're basically creating homes. You're creating homes. Everybody needs a home, including yeah. fish. Yeah. Yeah, you're That's creating a great homes way and to structure. Look at it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a place for fish to, to, to spawn and breed and avoid being eaten. Uh, yeah. It's a place for plankton, the plants and the animals, the zooplankton, the phytoplankton. It gives them a place to settle and grow. Where, where otherwise, if they don't, it'll just die and become what they call detritus, right? Ultimately becomes petroleum. So you're just allowing nature to use its own mechanisms to sort of rewild the ocean and kind of make up for man's uh, using of the oceans. It's a way to pay the rent. That's what it is, it's a way to pay the rent. That's just amazing that, so you're just sort of reconfiguring all, all of this mm -hmm. and just, I know you have a big team, but it's like a one man show. Okay, I'm gonna go save the ocean. Well, <laughs> you have to have the fire in the belly somewhere. Yeah. You, you know, and... Um, you do. You surely do. Yeah. And it, it goes back to my earliest days where I depended on the ocean basically to feed myself and my family. Oh. And, and that's, a, that's a very important point that I really believe uh, in supporting uh, sustainable fisheries and mankind's access to the ocean for food. Because that's ultimately where the bond starts. And you can, you can become a conservationist out of that. But the bond has to start somewhere. And so this project, the people that are involved in it, you know, like, like I say, our team, they're a bunch of ocean badasses. They, it gives their life great meaning and depth. And, yeah. and, and, and our donors will enjoy that meaning and depth and that significance and purpose because although it starts with just money, you're talking about creating a legacy that lasts for 500 years and creates marine life oh for 500 gosh. years, which is the highest form of good I personally can con conceive of. You know, and that, that's why I started it uh, uh, 12 years ago, because I, I was involved in a great tragedy at sea where, where I sunk at sea. I was out with, with four friends and we got T-boned by a, a barge in the middle of the oh, night. Oh, gosh. Yeah, in, off of San Diego, and it, and it, it, it sunk us dead. Oh. It, it, broke, it broke a 50-foot boat in half like a toothpick. And so, you know, I was out there treading water all night, and it's, it's, you know, in my boxer shorts, bleeding. Oh gosh! And, and sure that that was the end. Yeah. Yeah. Sure yeah. that that was the end. And when you're in a situation like that, you tend to make a lot of deals. Yeah. 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 You tend to make a lot of deals. So that that was the deal that I made. Was that if we could survive that, that I would do something like this. God. Yeah. Well, you're definitely delivering on that deal. You got to keep the promises. And what about um, the other people on the boat? Did they all survive too? Or That was the great miracle of it. Oh. I was able to get to finally to the escape pod and it, ex it explodes as a big eruption and that was kind of a beacon and, and somehow we, we all managed not to get you know rubbed out in the original collision and we made it in the escape pod and we floated all the way down into Mexico where the next day uh, the US Border Patrol found us down there off of Tijuana uh, and and we did we survived and, Gosh, and so, what a story yeah and so that was the that was the original fire in the belt yeah yeah wow that's a big fire and you you're stoking it all the time exactly gosh so all right, and so I heard you say South Carolina too, mm -hmm. right? You and and now I understand you're uh, you have a special project in Goleta. Uh, we do. Okay, so yeah, South Carolina was a huge success. The the, the state put uh, deployed those. The government did that. Sent some beautiful videos, which I showed last time. I believe we have another video coming up here, uh, and 
in Goleta. So we have been working on the permit process in one way or another for 12 years. And we are very proud to say that uh, the state land, California State Lands Commission, they're the ones that uh, kind of rent the seafloor out to three miles. They control all the public lands, including mm -hmm. the seafloor. They have issued us a permit to deploy a pilot, small pilot project of just 16 sea caves with a footprint that's just 60 feet by 60 feet, very small. It's on an empty piece of, of sand and 40 feet of water in Goleta Bay. Uh, and so they have issued that permit. Uh, Coastal Commission's given the thumbs up. It's the really uh, watershed. It's the first time in California history something like this has been permitted, but there's been so much support from folks at UCSB, from the government, from, the, from our fellow NGOs, from the fishing community especially. Um, stacks of letters of support. Everybody wants to see this go in because everybody wants their kelp forest back. Um, we're in the final stages of what you call um, final consultation with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, and the Northern um, Band of Chumash Indians. They ask for further consultation. So once um, those conversations reach a positive outcome, we'll be good to deploy uh, the 16 sea caves, load them right here in Santa Barbara Harbor and put them in the water. And we're gonna have, the county has agreed to fund the monitoring um, and uh, the Santa Barbara County Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission has uh, uh, funded the construction and deployment. So we'll have amazing underwater footage, even time-lapse footage, all this stuff to share on your show. Golly. Yeah. So now, Fish Reef Project is a uh, 501c3 mm -hmm. nonprofit, so people can make a tax-deductible financial donation, right? Yeah, they can. They can either go on the website uh, yep. and, and type it in there. Uh, larger donations can come in by um, mail, uh, or I'd be happy to take you know in-person meetings and explain the meeting, oh. the, the project further with individuals. So if somebody's interested in finding out more, maybe they want to invest more than, than just a donation, and so they can um, go on the website, get your contact information, mm -hmm. and you'll go and meet with them, and, or probably show them anything that they want to look at, and um, they could really make a, a sizable donation. Yes, yes. I, you know, once we get past what you call the pilot phase, okay, this, this first test, um, then there will be a multi-acre restoration project in there. And that's, ha that's going to have to go through full, uh, full environmental review and a number of other things. It would be quite costly. Uh, and then the construction and the deployment. It's a big, heavy-duty offshore marine engineering project, and it, and it will cost in the multitudes of millions of dollars to do that. Golly. So we do need uh, heavy hitters that have come in. We've had some wonderful donors. Santa Barbara Foundation has supported yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wonderful individuals like Albert Oaten mm -hmm. uh, was an individual that, that really made a lot of this possible. Uh, Decker Brands, folks like that That's have come great. in. That's great. And so we hope that individuals will step up and say, you know, I'd really like to make my money do something that I can see. Yeah. My kids can go out and swim around and, and say, that that's, that's what we did. That's our family legacy. And we can do that for you. Gosh, that is a beautiful vision. Mm -hmm. Chris, what you're doing is just amazing. And Thank we are so all much. so grateful. And I hope that a lot, of, a lot more people find out about what you're doing. And choose to financially support it. And so thank you for all you're doing and for coming on the show and telling us about it. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's been a, a privilege to come on your show a number of times. And Nonprofit Connect has just been such a wonderful way to reach our local community here in Santa Barbara, Montecito, Goleta. So thank you very much for your thank contribution, you. Senator. And thanks for joining us on 805 Focus, and we'll see you next time. So here we are in Baja, Mexico, deploying a number of sea caves in an area that is known for rich kelp growth, much like Goleta Bay in that area. And this is seven months after, just seven months, we have a fully grown start to a macrocystis giant kelp forest. This is in 49 feet of water on regular hard packed sand seabed. As you can see, there's... Oh, I can see it right underneath all that kelp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's so encrusted, you can barely tell it's a sea cave, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you can see the kelp goes all the way to the surface. Wow. And there's almost no surface left without some kind of algae growth or kelp growth on it. I mean, it really shows that the shape was just the right bet that the shape was perfect to recruit the kelp. You can see it's growing all over the feet, the vertical sides, on the top, all over it.
Those are happy fish. Yeah, those are female sheephead, which are hermaphrodites. They eventually turn into big bull male sheephead. You'll see in a moment what one of those looks like. And there's a nice calico bass already making a home in the kelp stocks. And again, the, the kelp is a wonderful way to remove carbon dioxide oh, directly from the ocean. That's important. And there's a couple of pink abalone, Haliotis rufescens, that are growing. And the lobster love it, especially in the warm months and the summer months. There's one of those large, big bull wow. female sheephead. The Spanish call those vieja. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And as you can see, it's fully encrusted inside and out. There's a, there's a beautiful picture just showing the giant kelp growing off the surface. Every one of the sea caves had some amount of giant kelp growing on it. So it was not an anomaly to have one. This was a nearby island. These are five months old. As you can see, it was a tough day underwater with a surge pulling us uh -huh. around. But the kelp grabbed right on that little lip that we built for that purpose. So this is five months and you've just seen seven months. So once they get the start like this in five months, they just shoot to the surface and it just becomes exponential. That's which, amazing. Which is great, Cinder, because when you're rebuilding a redwood forest, you have to wait a, wait a couple hundred years. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. This, this is seven months from the, from the beginning to the end. I mean, it's, it's incredibly gratifying uh, to see this result. Wow. And every form of marine life seems to love it. The fish, the scallops, the abalone, the lobster, all of the different kinds of marine algae. It's the entire ecosystem. So it's not what you call a monoculture crop. And if you had not put those sea caves there, there wouldn't be any of this uh, kelp. You no, know, it would just be empty sand. Just right? a bunch of sand. It's just a bunch of sand, which again, which is what most of the ocean is. So this is a way of creating an underwater oasis of life. And this is the primary tool that we will use to restore our lost historic kelp forests in Goleta. Oh. That's a big bull sheephead saying, this is my sea cave. <laughs> Nobody else is allowed in here. <laughs> that's a holdfast of a giant kelp plant grabbing onto the side of the sea cave that's exactly seven months old. Now this is, we plant kelp in places that don't have a nearby kelp forest to seed it. So we take baby plants, sometimes oh. when appropriate, and we attach them by wire, and then the holdfasts grab onto the sea cave, and then the wire basically just corrodes and goes away. And you're just left with this beautiful uh, burgeoning kelp forest. And it's mm. a way to give it a kickstart in areas uh, that don't have a lot of natural kelp seeding. That's obviously not a problem here. We do not think it's going to be a problem in Goleta. You probably won't have to plant kelp, but it's a really nice thing to have access to when you need it. This is really good sort of juxtaposition between sea caves that have been down for seven oh, months uh -huh. and ones that have only been down for three days. Oh gosh, yeah. So, so this is a brand new one. And then again, going over here by comparison, you swim along the sea floor. And it's just kind of a magic before and after comparison, right? And that is a sea cave. These are biogenic sea caves or biomimic sea caves, which means that they're supposed to mimic the form and function of nature. So after a number of years, as you can see by this video, you won't even be able to tell that they're a man-made object. They will, they will mimic nature to such a high degree, you'll swim over it and it will just look like nature put it there. It won't be some large obtuse thing that humans made. And these are sand bass after just 24 hours. Oh. These are calico bass after one month. You can see there's just a patina, just a light coating uh -huh. of marine algae on it. But yeah. that's what becomes this amazing oh, thing. Look this at lobster that found in just one day. Oh gosh. That's his home. He doesn't want to go anywhere. He's happy there. <laughs> He's a happy guy. And there's the team in Mexico. Oh, there's a lot. And of there's them. our yard full of sea oh, caves ready to go in the those. water. Yeah. We've been busy bees. And everyone is 2,400 pounds? 2,400 pounds. That's why they, Gosh. they lock onto the seafloor. They don't go anywhere, even in heavy surf. Thank you for sharing that with us. Wow. -wee. Thank you. You are doing some important work. Yeah. Well, I have to say my, my tagline now, which is, thank you for helping Ocean Life thrive. Woohoo! That's great. Thanks so much, Chris. <laughs>